Well, welcome to um, Selecting a Subject. Uh, I'm Harriet Risen, and uh, just finished a biography about Louisa May Alcott. And uh, to your to the left here is Steve Weinberg, uh, who teaches at the University of Missouri and has written a number of uh, biographies and uh, a book about writing biographies and of living people, particularly. And then um, to my right and his right is Carol uh, DeBurr Langworthy, who teaches at Brown and um, has rediscovered a, a writer named Neith Boyce, uh, who was uh, influential, part of that, the circle of Provincetown players, who included um, John Reed and in the village Mabel Dodge Bloom and uh, Louise Bryant and, and that, Eugene O'Neill and that group and has been working on her papers and a biography mm -hmm. about her. And uh, this is Beatrice um, Moose, Moosley Bennett, right? Mm -hmm. Just Moosley. And Beatrice um, writes in French and has written three biographies of uh, three writers. It really was a trilogy. She set it out as a trilogy. And she'll tell you more about how she chose that subject. And she has just actually just completed this trilogy and is on her way to Paris tonight to um, break it out there. All right, so Steve, you want to tell us um, how you found your subject? The most recent biography I wrote was a dual biography of John D. Rockefeller and Ida Tarbell, the journalist who brought him down. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, a, an unusual occurrence for me because usually I write about more contemporary figures. But uh, the quick version is, uh, some years ago, I became stereotyped, at least in the minds of editors, as an investigative journalist. And eventually, I ran day to day an organization called Investigative Reporters and Editors, which has about 1,500 members. And since all of a sudden I was more or less the spokesperson for investigative journalism, I figured maybe I better study the, the history of it a little bit better. And the more I studied the history of investigative journalism, because it wasn't called that until the 1970s, the more I realized that Ida Tarbell, who lived from 1857 to 1944, was probably the most important figure in what today we might call investigative journalism. Now, Lincoln Steffen's biographer happens to be sitting in the room, and he might say that Lincoln Steffen's was the most important figure. I think it's a toss-up, really. But he'd already done Lincoln Steffen so well, I had to argue for Ida Tarbell, right? <laughs> anyway, um, so I, I, I went and read the book that made Tarbell the most famous called The History of the Standard Oil Company, which was much more than a history. It was really an expose. It came out in 1904. I found the book in the uh, library at the University of Missouri in the town where I live. It hadn't been checked out since 1939, <laughs> but the pages were still together. And uh, I read it. It amazed me. I thought, more than ever, I've got to write Tarbell's biography. And I finally did. And it got published by W.W. W. Norton two years ago, trade paperback version last year. This is the only self-promotional thing I'll say. The trade paperback is for sale here. But the hardcover has the coolest cover ever. And the trade paperback doesn't. So I'm sorry the trade paperback is here. If you ever judge a book by a cover, judge my Ida Tarbell book by the cover. But it was a lot of fun, and maybe we'll talk about it more. OK. okay. All right. Um, I'm the biographer of Neith Boyce, who overlapped in time with Ida Tarbell, actually, 1872 to 1951. And uh, she got her start in journalism with Lincoln Steffens on the Commercial Advertiser in New York. Um, and wrote Lincoln Steffen some of the most revelatory letters, actually, that she did. Um, I feel that Neith sort of chose me. It's kind of hard to explain. Um, you can't hear? Can you talk a little bit more? Talk into the microphone? Yes, okay. I think it's, it's getting into the camera, but not to the audience. I so see. All right. You need to okay, so uh, how did Neith choose me? Um, I took the first women's history course offered at the University of Denver. I think it was the summer of 1974. 
uh, the university offered women's history because in the summer because they thought, well, it's, this is ephemeral. You know, it'll, it's just a fad. Maybe at one summer it'll take care of it. And we read a book by June Sochin on women in Greenwich Village, which had all of the big names that we now know, Emma Goldman, Mabel Dodge, Gert, Gert, not Gertrude Stein, um, Florence Howe, Crystal Eastman, and then there was this odd person, Neith Boyce. And there was actually quite little in the book about her, but she was very different from the other women in, the, in this group of radicals in Greenwich Village. Uh, for one thing, she was married, stayed married, had four children, uh, and then according to Sochin, had written intriguing short stories about women's condition that society just really didn't absorb at the time, and they were really quite radical. So that was it. All right. Uh, in the fall, June Sochin came out to Denver as guest scholar, and so I was able to ask her, well, who is this Neith Boyce, this woman with the strange name? And June said, well, nobody knows anything about her except that she's from California. And so I started looking for Neith's, what took a long time to get my hands on her writings, but the writing was so incredibly fresh and it seemed so incredibly contemporary in the 1970s that I just was struck by, you know, how come I've never heard of this person? She's a great writer. She's dealing with all these issues that are so contemporary. Uh, Got to do something about her. And since then, my whole life has been run by that. I did a master's thesis, a biography on her. My uh, PhD dissertation was an edition of her uh, autobiography and diaries, and then I published that um, in 2003. So I'm, I've, my whole life has been taken over by Neith Boyce, actually. It's been a dual existence since. Okay. I, so I'm wondering, you. actually, um, if we could have a show of hands of people in the audience, if any of you have chosen a subject for a biography that you're pursuing, and have any of you um, chosen a subject and then dropped it after working for a while on it for one reason or another? Well, maybe we can talk about what those reasons are. I'm also wondering, could we turn the air conditioning off? I think it would help. I don't have any control over the yeah. Also, if you're having trouble hearing, it's okay to up. sit up front. Yeah, right. We won't hurt you. And I don't know if the hall door. <laughs> All right. Okay, well, just keep raising your hands up in the back because there's a tendency to kind of drop your tone. All right, so let's hear from Beatrice now. Uh, the, the first writer I worked on, his name is Valérie Larbeau, and he was born at the end of the 19th century. And basically his writing life is between 1905 to uh, 1935. And um, I discovered him when I was in eighth grade, thanks to one of my teachers and um, discovered him and was fascinated by this man who was a poet, who was a novelist, an essayist, but uh, mainly wrote about train station, traveling, Europe, uh, all things I was really fond of when I was 14, and I'm still fond of, actually. Well, wasn't your father um, Yeah, my father was a railway company man, and um, I just, um, it totally fit into my, my world, and I was kind of amazed that somebody would write about those things. Um, then I went on reading all of his works, and uh, when I got to the PhD level, I did a PhD, I'm an IT library person by training, but I did a PhD because I wanted to write. But uh, I did not do my PhD on him specifically. Uh, I actually didn't want to spoil my interest in biography uh, through the PhD. So I did my PhD <laughs> on, I know, I'm, I'm really honest here. Um, I did my PhD on the literary magazine of the period, um, a literary magazine that existed between 1922 and 1924. And in that literary magazine were published all the names of his literary network. It was the first magazine that did a special issue on him he was alive and participated to it. And um, after that, I finished my PhD and just proposed my topic to a publisher. But meanwhile, I had discovered two other writers who were really linked to him through networks, through publishing, uh, who were Max Jacob and Philippe Soupeau. 
and, and they were in loosely the surrealistic, the surrealism? Um, you know? Jacob and Larbeau are not surrealists mm -hmm. at all. They're really something mm -hmm. else. And Philippe Soupeau is one of the two founders of the surrealist movement in France, mm -hmm. um, and such as kind of in the world. Um, but so that's how I started. And I, when I approached the publisher, I said, well, I really want to write a biography of Valéry Larbeau, but I also have in mind to write this other two after that. And I found a wonderful person who said, oh, OK, we'll go for it. And the last, the third one was published a month ago. So, so that's, that's how it happened. But they, all, they were all part of the same circles and same networks, though very different from one another as writers. Well, one of uh, the things that struck, has struck, struck me about selecting a subject that the subject is not the person. The subject is the person's world or the world personified in the subject. But um, I think for many of these biographers, and perhaps for you too, finding um, a subject is, is a way into something that you're very interested in, in uh, around a very um, big subject area. And for instance, when I chose uh, Louisa May Alcott, or she chose me, I'm afraid, because partly I didn't think she was a great writer, but she lived at the center of the transcendentalist movement and went through the Civil War as a first-hand observer and uh, made a fortune in the Gilded Age. Um, and so she was a great companion and also a very fresh voice to take us there. Now, I'm wondering if my friend Justin Kaplan would mind, would you tell us a bit about any of the uh, subjects that you have chosen or any that you chose and then dropped? <laughs> can you hear him all right, or can you yeah, take a mic to him? So another biographer no, beat you to it. Military maps are difficult. Corruption of the Golden Age. Uh -huh. <laughs> he, you didn't want him to take you to those places. <laughs> mm -hmm. And could you talk a little about Char Charlie Chaplin, that biography, or Charlie about Chaplin? I think it's interesting because we're talking about selecting a subject and it's sort of deselecting a subject. <laughs> Uh huh. So it seemed it just his story was better told in pictures. Mm -hmm. Una O'Neill Chaplin had was in possession of the important pa papers. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> so, so dealing with Lady Chaplin was. So Justin was in, in, in Chaplin's mountain house in Switzerland getting the creeps with Lady Chaplin. Uh, and the drunken former beauty. Yes, Justin's going to talk about it in dealing with the family. Well, um, th this is Justin Kaplan, who is a Pulitzer Prize and National Book Award winner, and has written biographies of Twain and Whitman and Lincoln Steffens, and uh, most recently a book about the Astors of New York, and with Anne Bernays, who's over there too, um, a joint memoir of, of back then, of their lives in New York in the 50s. It's a wonderful book. And uh, anyhow, I, I thought since he was here, and I knew that the chaplain was a, was a story that he had pursued and, and had not been able to complete, um, it might be I would wanted to take the opportunity to call upon him. So thank you very much. Uh, let's see. Well, one question that I have, and I think we've talked about a bit, and if you have questions at this point or subjects that you'd like to bring up, please put your hands up and we'll see if we can bring you into the conversation. But um, the biographer is on a quest and is looking for the subject, and as Carol described, and uh, Beatrice described, and I think for Carol especially, it was to unearth this person and rescue someone from oblivion. That might be a motive uh, for um, choosing a subject, some, to re right a wrong, you know, someone's reputation, as um, Jean Strauss seemed to feel, was unfair, untrue, and you might, that might be another good reason to, to use a subject. Um, but I wonder to talk about, I think that, that the subject's life or the story may answer some questions for the biographer that the biographer may not even be thinking that they have. For it, I have never, only till recently, examined my fascination with Louisa May Alcott. I kind of wanted to leave well enough alone. But as, as time went on, I began to realize what the connection was and um, how it was motivating me and <coughs> answering questions, that, basic questions that I had about how to live my life and who I was and what my family was and what these obligations were. So I wondered if the other biographers would like to talk a little about what it is that feels like it's, it's addressing in your life. Carol, you want to start? Mm, boy, this gets to be self-revelation, I'm afraid. Um, in fact, um, I have consulted a therapist to try to <laughs> disentangle my issues from some of Neith's issues. Um, what happens is that um, I think when you research any historical person and their family, you find that there are scandals and every family has some skeletons in the closet. Um, and I found um, many more than Neith had actually revealed. Uh, and 
Her children knew nothing about it. Her grandchildren knew nothing about some of these scandals. Like Neith's mother and her father had a child together while he was still married and they were teachers in Lake Forest, Illinois. And that explains like why they, her parents could never be teachers again. Mm -hmm. uh, that sort of, th there were all sorts of like gaps like that. Um, so those are some of the scandals. And then in these family, it, there are generations of addiction uh, stories. And uh, in my, fam my birth family, uh, it's a different kind of addiction story, but I realize that they're the, the same kind of behavioral patterns, no matter what the <laughs> substance might be. Um, and I hadn't really realized that that was one of the things that was um, a resonance for mm -hmm. me mm -hmm. until I got really far along into mm -hmm. this. Um, so yeah, so some of the things that she couldn't talk about or chose never to reveal to anyone, um, she dealt with in her fiction. So now, then I started reading her fiction very differently. Mm -hmm. And um, I think Jean Strauss was saying that, or someone else was saying, that you have to be careful about using someone's fiction as evidence, as autobiographical evidence. So that's what I'm kind of weighing now, mm -hmm. is like uh, how much credence can I give right. to this one character as, you know, acting as an agent for some of Neith's compulsions or something. Right. So that uh, must have so was disillusioning. You were first right. somewhat in love with yeah, Neith's right. And I think that happens, that you're you're in love with your subject. I mean, why wouldn't you? But a, a reporter, a, a reviewer, just yesterday said that my book, you know, was a romance, and that I was in love with my subject. And I thought, well, I'm not in love with Louisa May Alcott, but I was lo in love with the subject of Louisa May mm -hmm. Alcott. Um, and about the novels, uh, I also felt, having made a film also about Louisa May Alcott was that the life of the imagination was also her life. Mm -hmm. So that when, in the film, we um, talked about the thrillers, the pulp fiction thrillers that she wrote, we dramatized just a few lines from each of them, and we had the actress playing Louisa in a kind of a black space, like in, in costumes, and enacting her own characters. And I thought that was, um, you know, valid, I guess in, in film terms anyway, but so that's a question that actually is active in my mind mm -hmm. about using fiction, um, especially fiction that you know is somewhat autobiographical, mm -hmm. um, and, and thinking that, well, as Madeline Stern, Alcott's first biographer, told me everything she wrote was autobiographical one way or another. She wrote down everything, she observed everything. And of course she changed it, but is it valuable to allude to it, you know, at a place in the story where um, it, it it has a bearing, it's enlightening to consider something that she did in a novel which is closely related to life. And if it's clearly indicated that in the novel, her sister says to her, I'm gonna die, don't ever write again, Take home, stay home and take care of mom and dad, you know. Well, that's in Little Women. So I suspect something like that happened. Um, and that's really how I think it could be couched. You know, you're not gonna know, but it didn't come out of nowhere, even if it isn't literal, even if it was maybe only a perception that she had of projecting uh, what she thought her sister might be asking of her. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to parse that, that sure. charge of being in love with your subject. Of course we're in love with our subjects, otherwise how are we gonna devote 20, 30 years to the relationship. I mean, it's like a marriage almost. No, and and Bernays. <laughs> I was thinking of Ron Ro Rosenbaum's uh, biography of Hitler, which is too long to be sure been edited, but it's incredibly good. It's profound. And I, I, I wonder how Rosenbaum, as a Jew, could write a biography which is essentially not sympathetic, but on the other hand, he treats him as a human being, mm -hmm. and it is incredibly revealing, and I think we're thinking, I'm, we're thinking about what a biographer, yes. as, as doing something, writing 
Yeah, well, if it's just a monster, it. you can't it's understand it. Starting it by saying, well, maybe I'll like it at the end. You would never do that. So, Actually, before we get, I actually talked to Rosenbaum about that when the book came out because I was writing about the book. Yeah. And as, as you know, Anne, it, Rosenbaum, there have been you know, straightforward biographies of Hitler. Rosenbaum's angle was he, the book is called Explaining Hitler. And Rosenbaum wrote about Hitler from a very different angle. What Rosenbaum wrote was the story of Hitler's biographers and how so many different biographers came to such different conclusions about Hitler's motivations. So I think that's how, if I understood Rosenbaum correctly when he was talking to me shortly after the book came out, it was that slightly skewed angle, getting into the lives of Hitler's biographers instead of writing a straightforward biography that helped keep him sane. True. By, by telling the story of how his mother got breast cancer and they called in a Jewish doctor and the Jewish doctor was unable to save him, therefore, mm -hmm. the, the Holocaust. Yeah. I don't believe that for a minute, yeah. but that was, that was one of the theories yeah. and that's one of the things that you did write about. Yeah, and it was also one of the theories of the biographers who Rosenbaum was trying to parse. Mm -hmm. So he came at it from his own education, studying all these biographies of Hitler, but he also came at the book through the biographers themselves. You're right, it's just a, it's an amazing book, whether you agree with it or not. Well, how about the question of there, there being multiple biographies of someone? I don't know about you, Beatrice, but there were, there were no, not, there um, weren't others. Interestingly enough, I mean, I didn't choose them for that, obviously, mm -hmm. and, uh, but as I started to work on them, I discovered that there was not a biography, a single biography of Larbeau, of Jacob and of Sucour before mine. So I'm actually the first uh -huh. one for, for the three of them. So. Well, that, yeah. I know that you, Steve, have said that you really would rather uh, till fresh ground. Yeah. There's actually, in the latest newsletter that Jamie, you know, the convener, most of you have seen the biographer's craft, right? Mm -hmm. There is an interview in, probably some of you already read it, a Q&A with T.J. Stiles, uh, the biographer of Vanderbilt and Custer. And Stiles says something that is completely foreign to me as a biographer. I'm not saying one is right and one's wrong, but he says, I'm working on a biography of George Armstrong Custer. Often a biographer is motivated by a belief that previous biographers missed an important interpretation of a subject or hadn't covered the subject definitively before. By contrast, says Stiles, I pick Custer out of respect for previous work on him. After almost seven years on Cornelius Vanderbilt, discovering most of the sources for the first time, I wanted a nicely mapped life with lots of well-identified manuscript collections. I want to change the camera angle on Custer to look at him as a figure on a chronological frontier more than a geographical one, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that's Stiles' motivation. He's won lots of awards. I haven't. I'm not arguing with him. But that would never motivate me. That kind of deal would never motivate me. Of course, I'm the shallow one up here. I'm the one without the, you know, the PhD, and I'm the non-academic. But, um, but uh, anyway. You had a question? Yes. I'm hearing a theme in this discussion about what the biographer's relationship is to the subject. And I had a quick question for you when this reviewer said you were in love with your subject. Was that a compliment or was that a criticism? Um, on, on the whole, it was a compliment. It said it was respectful and um, sympathetic. And I wish I could put it better. She kind of, she didn't say it's a, it's a hagiography. It Anything like to that, but our old view of the biographer is sort of this impersonal observer mm -hmm. who does not force an interpretation. Would never admit that they had own their mm -hmm. own family issues that resembled the subject's family issues, and and that seems to be changing. And I'm just interested 
in how that's changing, how we are or are not becoming more acceptable of a more personal approach to mm -hmm. Yes, you had a point. Well, I was just, I'm not a panelist, but I was just going to comment because I think it's very interesting what you're, I see the same thing you do, and not to be too academic because I'm not, but some of you probably know about the postmodernist movement, which mm -hmm. basically says objectivity doesn't exist and right. there's only, and I think that has had an effect on the culture as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, so I think part of it is that we're more willing to recognize our subjectivity. But then that leads me also to, and this does relate to choice of subject, obviously, because it is a personal decision. Um, but it, it also leads you to the question of how do you take the feelings you bring um, and then turn them into art, you know, which I think still does exist, separate from the question of objectivity, but closely linked to it, right? Because the reader has to trust you in your voice, and you have to trust you in your voice from the evidence. So, I, so in terms of selecting a subject, I think that it's a really interesting question because it's on the one hand so personal, on the other hand, you have to have the motivation to take whatever you're drawn to and turn it into something else. Mm -hmm. Well, at one point I imagined uh, sitting at dinner with Louisa May Alcott, who you might have passed, you know, as a contemporary woman, if you were to uh, have that chance. And I wondered, would I like her? And I thought, oh, no, 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 I'm not sure I would have liked her. And I'm pretty sure she would not have liked me, <laughs> for what it's worth. But you know, I, I did clearly, I did think about what her flaws were, and and there were many, you know. So I, I certainly painted her as fallible, but I don't object to the comment, but I did feel that it was more true that I uh, loved the whole subject around her, her life, her surroundings, places she takes you to, and that sort of thing, and uh, the relations within her family, and the subject in that sense, yes? Well, you know, I, um, a lot of publishers don't worry about that. I mean, there have been literally hundreds of biographies of, a of Abraham Lincoln in the English language. And uh, Marilyn Monroe is catching up, mm -hmm. but I think Lincoln still has the lead. And so sometimes uh, publishers don't worry about that, either because they believe a good Lincoln book will always sell, no matter how many else are out there, partly because it's a biographer they really respect based on past work, partly because um, th there are, like T.J. Stiles says in this newsletter, many different angles. I, you know, I try to make my living completely as a writer. I've occasionally taught, but I, I cannot ignore the commercial aspects. So if somebody said to me, we'll give you a lot of money for another biography of Abraham Lincoln. I'm just speaking hypothetically now. They, I don't think they would, but because um, he's not a good fit with my talents, whatever they are. But I would probably still say no, unless I was really desperate, because I don't want to write biographies of people who have been covered a lot. And, you know, so that's a personal decision. Well, you're an investigative reporter. You right. want to mm -hmm. go find the new facts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, when I started on Louise May Alcott, there had been no biography of her for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And the, the biography in the 70s was, came from the point of view of Louise May Alcott's uh, pulp fiction thrillers, mm -hmm. which were very dark and, and kind of cast her as the heroine of those thrillers and the victim of her father, to mm -hmm. oversimplify it. But it, to me, it didn't bring out her wit and a lot of other things. I thought, so I thought it was valid to have a new interpretation. Yes. Well, she could turn on a dime. She could turn on you. Um, she expressed it as being moody, but uh, she could be very cutty. And why she wouldn't like me? Because I'm too nosy. <laughs> <laughs> All biographers are. She yeah. didn't like other nosy women. <laughs> mm. Yeah, she could be pretty self-righteous, too. And, and she did burn uh, a lot of her uh, journals and things, which is why at points I resorted to the fiction because it was autobiographical and I didn't have anything else to say how she worked as a laundress and a governess and every job mm -hmm. a woman could have at that time. Go ahead. 
some of those instances where you start a biography or you start your research and then you find out there's just another person doing something that's exactly the same mm -hmm. oh, subject? Is that, is that like the end of the no, there, there was a very famous case. Uh, it's the two biographies of Henry James that came out at the same mm -hmm. time in England. One is uh, by Colin Polim, mm -hmm. and the other one is by David Lodge. Mm -hmm. And they're about James, but they're novels. Mm -hmm. Mine was a novel. Well, it, it was well, it was a novel, but it's they were very They are very very biographical. Yeah. <laughs> um, they they are, they they are. Um, Lodge says about his that he, it's a novel because he takes an angle, um, that is the the theater one, and it starts by the because David um, Henry James was a great writer, but he was not the best play writer. Mm -hmm. um, so he really tried to see his life through the, the, the lens of the playwriting. Uh, but frankly, it's a very good biography of James anyway, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, even though he says it's a novel. Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, and it, those two came out at the same time, and actually David Lodge wrote a book about the two bio coming out at the oh, same really? time and but how they, were, they played against uh, one another. But they were very complimentary, I thought. They were. They uh, actually, I, I read the Not from both. an author's point of view. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I, to me, I, I think it amplified the interest mm -hmm. rather yeah. than diminished The it. most dramatic example I can think of, we've got lots of people in the room who can probably think of others, but there was a six-month period some years ago when four biographies of J. Edgar Hoover came out in a six-month period, and I know that for a fact because I got asked to review all four and compare and contrast. Um, but it, um, obviously it can be an author's nightmare to have a similar book come out at the same time. The only time I've worried about it was the one time I got a really big advance from a publisher and a lot was riding on this because, you know, I at the time was delusional, delusional enough to think maybe I could make my whole living writing books someday. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky enough to get a big advance from a great publisher, and I was looking over my shoulder all the time. I did everything I could to try to make sure nobody else was out there. And you can usually be pretty sure on most subjects by consulting archivists and others who would probably know if another biographer were out there. Mm -hmm. um, but you can never be sure. The other books I've done where the stakes were much lower in terms of making my living, I haven't worried about it because it's so much trouble just worrying about getting the book done. If you start worrying about everything else, right, right. you might go completely right. crazy instead of only semi-crazy like most of us. Well, I and tell you an interesting story about that, I think. About 7 a.m. one morning, I got a phone call from Susan Cheever who said, I hear you're writing a book about Louisa May Alcott. Is that true? <laughs> and I said, yes, it is. And she said, well, how did you, you know, get contract because I've been trying to write a book about her for years <laughs> and nobody will let me, you know, because she's not supposed to be popular. And, and there were years when I couldn't really sell um, anybody on this as, as a film, which started out as a film. Uh, and then suddenly uh, the National Endowment for the Humanities stepped in with money for a film and, you know, then suddenly to the publishers it looked more viable. And uh, hmm. so she said, well, I guess I'm not going to write one. I I, they won't let me. And <laughs> then um, Geraldine Brooks wrote the novel March, which uh, features Bronze and Alcott at, in, uh, in, in, as, as Mr. March away at the Civil War, the untold part of Little Women. And um, John Madison, who has become a friend because he's in the film, uh, wrote a wonderful dual biography of Bronze and uh, Alcott and Louisa. And, it was really fine, and it won the Pulitzer Prize. And you can imagine, I felt, you know, a little bit abashed that two years later, my little, you know, story was going to come out. But they, they both seem to have found audiences, and um, I, I guess people who are interested, I don't know if they'd want to read both of them. But when I look on Amazon, I often see that people, some people bought it with Eden's Outcasts, or or Eden's Outcasts instead. But usually not if they've come to your page. But mm -hmm. yeah, there's there are boomlets about these things. And Susan Cheever is writing an, a biography of Louisa May Alcott. And it's due out soon. Yeah. Uh, but then a publisher published Cheever's book about Concord, American which, Bridge, which mm -hmm. had um, 
Florence and Alcott is one of the main characters in the, in the book. And some silly speculation about Emerson having a sexual activity with Margaret Fuller would seem to be a little bit ridiculous. But now, but, but it's odd that they would publish that book and not one that she would write about Alcott. Well, it, I suspect it's because it was a broader group, and there is a lot of em interest in Emerson and Thoreau and some of the people around her. I don't really know, though. Um, but they still said no, Louisa, even though that book did quite well. Yeah. Um, could those of you on the panel from Blues and Relevant uh, talk about your thoughts about your next biography, if you're thinking about a next biography? Yes. I, me, Boyce, knew so many people who were of great interest, and a number of them were her husband's lovers, about whom she would be fairly quiet in the letters, but I have since learned more about those women. Um, and the one I'm most interested in now, and I'm hoping other biographers in the room will help me, she, her niece's husband wrote a book called An Anarchist Woman in 1909 and called her Marie. Uh, Marie was the lover of Terry Carlin, who was Eugene O'Neill's best drinking buddy and the, the prototype for Larry Slade in was it Long Day's Journey. Uh, anyway, uh, I, I need to find Marie's real name because the anar an anarchist woman tells the story of, uh, it's a really a, a real American tragedy. And I've just learned that she did commit suicide in California late in life, but uh, it's, it's, it's a, a Theodore Dreiser type story, only much more interesting. So yeah, I'm interested. I, I want to find out about Marie now. So you, it's sort of a, a, another, a character in your other biography that you want to right. expand yeah. on. Right. Is anybody else thinking about this? Book? What about you? What are you thinking of doing next? Maybe if you know. uh, I have a couple of ideas, but right now it's in discussion, so I'm just as somebody who's very superstitious, I don't talk about uh, it. <laughs> maybe this is too far, but I'm thinking just to characterize it in the abstract. Like, you know, is it someone from the same time period? No, uh, to that I can I can respond. Um, it's actually somebody who is more contemporary, dead, but more contemporary. We had the conversation about dead people earlier. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, definitely what I'm wishing to is get out of the period because I wrote those three biographies but I also wrote other books about the period um, and especially uh, quote unquote biography of a publishing house of the same mm -hmm. 20s mm -hmm. and um, writing the last one sometimes I was like I already said that and then I realized <laughs> oh but it's in another book uh, nobody's going to read that other book yeah. I really need to talk about this thing and it really felt like, okay, this is 20 years of research, of yeah. life with those subjects. I need to turn the page, and which doesn't mean that I'm not going to write any articles, or, but definitely no other books. Yeah. Um, Steve, what about you, Steve? Um, I'm in s sort of a surprising position for me. Um, one of the biographies I wrote, the one of Armand Hammer, everybody knew that he would sue me if I wrote it, and he did. So in, you know, in one case, I wrote a biography of someone who I knew would be hostile, but I felt like the life needed an honest telling. I was the only biographer, either courageous enough or stupid enough, to write about him while he was alive. Four came out after he died, and he couldn't sue anymore. Mm -hmm. but, um, and then, you know, then I did Ida Tarbell, who of course was long dead. And the, the person I'm really burning to do now, I'll tell you the name in a minute, You'll, most of you will know it, I'm in the odd position Publishers seem to be very interested, but only if I get cooperation. And I've never tried to get cooperation before. I didn't try to get Hammer's cooperation. I, I mean, I told them what I was planning to do, but I certainly didn't expect cooperation. Ida could only cooperate from beyond the grave. And the, the person I'm really burning to do is Gary Trudeau, Doonesbury. Mm -hmm. But he's extremely private. Mm -hmm. He's hardly ever cooperated with a magazine profile. He's not mean about it. He just is private. Plus, he's married to someone who was, and I suppose still is famous, Jane Pauley, who's apparently also very private. I've had a conversation with Trudeau, 
but I don't think I'm going to be able to persuade him to be cooperative. So that one's probably dead. I don't see much point in trying to do it without him because I don't think publishers would be very enthusiastic or at least not enthusiastic enough to give me an advance that I need to live. So that's where I am. What happened when you got sued? What happened when I got sued? Well, does everyone know who Armand Hammer is? There's so many young people in the room. <laughs> I see nodding. I, I, I know one young know. person in the room. Do you know? You know who the name? Okay. I did, I'm not trying to embarrass you. I mean, why should you? <laughs> at, at the time the book came out in the 80s, he was alive, elderly, but alive. He was both a, a, a I was going to say famous, I'd say more infamous citizen diplomat, business person, art collector, a real nasty piece of work, and who was a congenital liar, but somehow mostly got good press. And uh, he paid for one biography of himself, which was not disclosed in the book, by the way. Shame on Harper and Row, which back then was an estimable publishing house, but brought out a biography of Hammer that he paid for and didn't disclose it. Anyway, so we all knew he was going to sue. We, um, he sued in England. I knew when I signed a contract in England that he'd sue over there instead because it was so much easier to prevail. But of course, if I hadn't signed the contract in England, then he's already won, right? Besides, am I going to turn down an extra $45,000? I don't think so for the English contract. So uh, what happened was uh, there were several years of litigation, enough money spent to feed all the poor in the world, which just broke my heart. You know, all that money spent on solicitors and oh my god. And just before we were going to go to trial, he died. And one thing that is similar in British law is you cannot carry on the lawsuit if you're dead. I mean, your family cannot carry it on. We have somebody in the room, I don't know if she wants to be recognized or not, who's been sort of the, um, the target of at least threatened litigation. You want to talk, Kitty? <laughs> well, I've become the darling of the ABA. <laughs> I've never successfully, I've never successfully been sued, but that doesn't mean I haven't been sued. And I've learned from the best how to defend myself, and that was Frank Sinatra. Um, I, I was writing uh, an unauthorized biography of Frank Sinatra seven years ago, and he sued me to prevent it. He dropped his suit after a year. However, before he dropped it, his lawyers called my lawyers to say, we have a tape recording of Kitty Kelly calling someone up and saying, Frank told me to call, he gave me your number, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. well, Publisher came to Washington where I live. My lawyers are there. Frank Sinatra's lawyers are there. And I have to tell you, when my husband called and told me that they said they had this tape recording, I thought, well, maybe, you know, maybe I got, maybe I snapped my cap and did it. <laughs> maybe, you know, at three in the morning I was so scared. I mean, I knew I didn't, but if someone says they have a tape recording, they came to Washington, they put it on the tape recorder. And it sounded like a cross between uh, Boy George and Minnie Mouse. <laughs> 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 you could see all these high-priced lawyers going like this. <laughs> and I was terrorized. And the big law firm from Los Angeles, so Melvin and Myers that I had to hire, and the law firm in D.C., and the, everybody was in on it. And they just said, oh, it's hideous. <laughs> this proves that someone was ready to perjure himself, go into court. And I said to the, you know, thousand dollar a minute lawyers, what do I do? How do I protect myself against somebody who would do that? And he said, well, just tape record everything. We can't tape record everything, uh, especially on certain telephone calls in certain states. So what I would do, I've done it ever since. I would write to Professor Weinberg after our interview, and I'd say, Dear Steve, thank you so much for giving me the time during your panel on May 15th at UMass. I didn't get a chance to tell you. I was so taken with that sleeveless sweater you wore. Was it navy blue? Oh, it was so great to see you. <laughs> and when you were sitting next to so-and-so in the aqua blue, I was just so glad that I would rattle on like that. Because four years from now, when my book comes out, oh, the memory of going 
close, goodbye, goodbye. And Steve might say, never talk to her. The one next to him might say, I don't know what she's talking about. It. But at least I would have a contemporary reference. Yeah, but and in this case, you've got a film. Yeah, <laughs> right. Successfully but it costs to defend yourself. I mean, there's yeah. no, Pardon? but it's it's very hard to you, yes, legal but insurance. Yes, we get to that. Yes, I have so many lawyers that go through that. If you step forward and your lawyer contacts the publisher and you want to bring suit, the publisher's lawyer will step forward and say, "Right, excuse me, we have three letters, we have emails, yeah, sure. we have documentation, and, yeah. and that has taken care of it." Thank you, God. But that's a lot of work. Yeah. It's a lot of work, but you have to protect yourself hmm. from the lawsuit. You just have to. How can you, on what grounds did Sinatra sue, sue you before? He sued me uh, before I'd written a word on a race. used car salesman provision in the state of California that says you cannot use an image to sell. And that was his basis. But he didn't need a basis, Anne, because what he really was doing was sending terror mm -hmm. around the world saying, I don't want this book written. I haven't given her permission. She's yeah. doing it without my control. Mm -hmm. It was effective. It was effective? Not really. No, no, it didn't, it didn't yeah. people didn't clam up for Many fear. Did. Many did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but I interviewed almost a thousand people for the book. It took four years. So those that planned up, and they were afraid, grown men were afraid they were going to be killed. Um, you still can do it. It just takes so much. Persistent. After yes, reading well, her Sinatra book, I was afraid <laughs> I might be killed just for reading it. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, <laughs> yes. On that book, there were people, there were people when the book came out that wrote letters to the chairman of the board of Gulf and Western saying, I never gave her an interview and at the bottom, CC, Mrs. Ronald Reagan. Uh -huh. oh. And so when a letter goes to the chairman of the board of your publishing house, believe me, they don't ignore it. Mm -hmm. They call you. Mm -hmm. Time after time, I mean, I had to produce the tapes right. again, the letters. Mm -hmm. There were so many people that did that, and they did it just to please Mrs. Reagan. Mm -hmm. Many who, they'd all talked. Yeah, well, I, my uh, husband was, was doing um, a biography of uh, his father, who was a blacklisted screenwriter, and he got the FBI files. Um, in the Freedom of Information Act, and in there were several letters from uh, his father's brothers who were just kind of covering their, their asses, you know, saying, mm -hmm. you know, he takes this newspaper, and wow. but my husband has never told his cousins, uh, you know. Okay. How dissolute can it yeah. family? And one of them has the, um, Hirschfeld, the Al Hirschfeld portrait of his father, wow. you know, we want to say, Give us that portrait. But <laughs> it was a he was a friend of Al Hirschfeld, so he was he was painted by him. Hmm. Anyway, other questions? Um, dangers, perils, persistence pays off. Linda, do you want to tell us how you got to choose on uh, Harry Moore? Um, I was looking for a dissertation topic, so I come from academia and I felt So Marianne Moore, just to repeat if you didn't hear yeah. the, the poet. And um, I had been interested in, since high school, the group of writers and artists around the Stieglitz Circle in mm -hmm. New York in the 19-teens and 20s. And um, I was first interested in William Carlos Williams, but lots had been done on him. And Marianne Moore was a part of that group, so I decided to do my dissertation on Moore and the visual arts. And it was in the process of doing um, research, archival research for that book, that I discovered how
how interesting Moore's personal family life was. And there was a biography that came out. Um, he, that biographer, um, ran afoul of the estate, and so at the last minute had to remove all his quotations from that biography. Um, they tried to prevent it from being published. Um, it was published anyway, and so my, but I had a, a relationship with the estate requesting for permission to quote for my first book. And so my first order of business when I decided to write a biography on Moore is I approached the estate and um, met with Moore's nieces in New York for a three hour lunch. And it was an interview, I had no idea, but they were interviewing me for the position of biographer. And um, apparently I passed muster, so that's how that came about. And it is, I mean, it's the whole relationship between myself and her, um, it's something that I think about. I try not to think too much about it because I knew going into it that it was going to be my story of Marianne Moore. Um, I told the nieces when I took it on, I said, the Marianne Moore that I write about may not be the Marianne Moore that you knew as an aunt, um, but this, and they said, that's okay. So um, they seem to recognize that. And it's been, um, well, fun for me. I don't know about fun for them, but they have learned a lot of juicy details <laughs> about, they're, they're very close family, so it's not as though um, anything was um, intentionally hidden from them, but they've learned that their stick in the mud grandmother, um, whom they never liked and who was extremely puritanical, um, actually was involved in a lesbian relationship for 10 years um, when she was the mother um, from the, during the whole time of Marianne Moore's adolescence. And they had no idea about this whatsoever. So anyway. Yes. Um, I wonder if people could come in on uh, sort of part of the same conversation about the personal relationship that, at least in my case, the first person I wrote about was someone I somewhat identified with for various reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I'm thinking about Jean Strauss, is obviously it was easier for her to identify with Alice James being female and being maybe, mm -hmm. who knows what Jean Strauss's own life has been like in terms of powerful brothers or whatever. But clearly Morgan was going in the opposite direction as she said. And she sort of, it's almost, I got the feeling like she felt confident enough as a biographer to tackle a complete challenge mm -hmm. as opposed to easing her way into a subject where she felt like fairly oriented for one reason or another. So I'm wondering to what extent, you know, the first biography, the second biography choice falls along those lines. Maybe if any of you, I mean, I guess you've written more than one. Do you, how, how does that strike you? Um, you know, I was interested in, in Ida Tarbell, even though I knew there probably wouldn't be a big advance, um, partly because of that you know, important connection to investigative journalism, but also, I hope I don't offend anybody, um, starting to sound reverse sexist, but I'm much more interested in women than in men. And <laughs> Armand Hammer you know, was sort of like J.P. Morgan. I mean, there was no inner life there. <laughs> And, and I, I think as a generalization with obviously millions of exceptions, yeah. women tend to have richer inner lives than men. Yeah. So since I wanted to do somebody who was very important in the evolution of investigative reporting, I wasn't going to do Lincoln Steffens after you did it, Justin. God, I mean, <laughs> who could approach that biography? So, so, I mean, Ida Tarbell was an obvious choice. And to me, it was a real bonus that she was a she. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, I got some criticism, the presumption of a man writing about a woman, um, not from fellow biographers, at least not to my face, but from some people. Um, but uh, I guess that, I, don't, I guess that's about as deep as I can go. Does that help at all? <laughs> yeah, well it's interesting, the second, I mean, the Tarbell book was more personal for you than the Hammer, the Hammer book? The ha Hammer book was a very commercial choice. Yes. I mean, I, I was trying to find someone who hadn't been done, who might bring a big advance, because I wanted to see if I could make it as a book writer. And I mean, he, it was, oh, it was just dreadful spending that many years <laughs> inside that empty head right. and dealing with that vanity and the lies. I mean, I kind of like the lies, because that's about investigative reporting, right. you know, uncovering the lies. But oh, it, was, it wasn't probably not as unpleasant as Stalin or Hitler, but pretty close. 
Yeah, and I, I wrote about three men. Um, and I have to say that when I first chose to write about a man, I, you know, I didn't really think about any of those issues. And uh, 25 years ago, gender studies in France were not that big anyway. Um, so it was not, I never thought about it. And I, I'm kind of thinking about it now that it's done. Um, I, I guess if I really, if I'm, if I'm asked, I would say, yeah, I would prefer a woman. But on the other hand, I didn't mind those men at all. And they, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, I, I could feel very close to them. I felt very close to their writing. And I have to say, I'm writing literary biographies. I'm really insisted on the work and the writing. I'm not discounting the personal life and the scandals and stuff that comes with it. But really, my, my objective is to uh, unearth what, what did the work, what, how the, the work came to be. Um, and the other thing is, not only there were three men, but two of them were involved in um, in religion, uh, the, the first two, Larbeau and Jacob, both converted. Uh, one from Protestantism to Catholicism, one from, and the other one from Judaism to, to Catholicism, which is also an interesting um, component mm -hmm. of the, which, you know, I'm not Christian at all, so, um, but that was also an interesting moment um, to think about. Well, I think it's, it's really clear that over the last 30 or 35 years that many women uh, who are interested in biography have chosen relatively unknown women to explore their lives and um, certainly to uh, reflect upon their own in the process and to uh, put some models out there. But And I was thinking, gee, uh, I guess that's for me too. But then I remembered that the first biography I attempted was of a man uh, a director named Preston Sturgis, who was very funny, and I should have known, you know, because <laughs> I knew it was a terrific subject years before there was any biography of him, and, but I was having to go back to original magazines. There was really what, nothing written about him, but then I thought, well, gee, you know, he wanted to be a filmmaker and be funny, and I wanted to, I was interested in fun and film. But also, um, he spent half his a year with his uh, mother in Europe, who was Isadora Duncan's best friend, oh. you know, walking around in togas, you know, <laughs> and, and hanging out with that crowd, and then they were divorced. So he spent six months a year in Chicago with his stockbroker father, you know, dressed in a suit and going to prep school. <laughs> and there was something about, you know, that division um, that really appealed to me and that I, uh, struck me as, as relevant to me. And he also went on to invent kiss-proof lip lipstick, you know, so, uh, and, and a lot of crazy things. By the way, uh, real quickly on the woman-man thing, for the, yeah. the the novices or the really young people, there's an amazing book, at least I think, called Writing a Woman's Life by Carolyn Heilbrunn, mm -hmm. and I strongly recommend it. It also has the virtue for those of you who are busy of being very thin. Mm -hmm. It's not many pages, but it sure is deep. And it's about, in general, writing about... Do you about agree or disagree? Uh, well, I kind of, I, I would add a caveat, because even though she didn't frame it that way, she's really writing about literary biography. Right, mm -hmm. right. And it's not the same as other kinds. Like, I write about a social reformer, and I found her book far less useful for thinking about people who led activist lives as okay. opposed to writing lives. Mm -hmm. So but I, I wish she had made that clearer. Okay. On the other hand, she wrote a biography of Gloria Stenheim. Mm -hmm. She did. Yes. Mm -hmm. But it so, was... Well, she's right, too. Yeah. 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 But we what had happened, the, what happened to the Preston Sturgis project? <laughs> well, I, I wrote about 50 pages of it. I was very young at the time, and times were different. And I was hitchhiking, and um, I got into this guy's car, and he really made me very nervous. And the minute I could, I got out of the car, and I left the manuscript behind, and there was oh no Xeroxing in those days. And I didn't have much confidence in myself, frankly. I didn't believe I could really do this, you know. Nobody knew about Preston Sturgis, who could possibly be interested. And uh, I took it as a sign, so um, I wish I'd had more confidence. And I never hitchhike again. <laughs> yes? Um, I'm interested in the sequence of biographers biographies about a particular person, a 
because I'm writing the second biography of Marianne Moore, and people have said, well, why don't you take this approach or this approach? And I feel as writing the second biography of Marianne Moore, especially since the first one was missing certain things, I feel a responsibility to write a particular kind of biography. Whereas if you're going to write a biography of Lincoln now, um, um, Lincoln as writer, or you know, you can write about particular aspects or take a more innovative approach. So I'm interested from hearing from you or anybody else in the room about how your biography sort of fit into the history of biographies of yourself. Well, I've had a lot of discussions with, you know, acquiring editors on that yeah. topic. And I, I mean, this is going to sound so lame, I guess, but most of the acquiring editors I've had this discussion with, even those I consider the most intellectual acquiring editors out there, most that I've talked to have the attitude the general readership is only going to read one biography of somebody. So they come to yours fresh, and in a way, it doesn't matter what came before, because yours will probably be the only biography they'll ever read of Marianne Moore. The more sort of, I guess you'd say, neurotic acquiring editors would, you know, would, sit, would sit with you for hours discussing how yours needs to be different from everybody else's, but they're thinking more of an audience of the literary critics. So that's about the only light I can shed on it. Anybody can shed more light on it? <laughs> Is that Patty? <laughs> Patty? Patty? She's my friend too. <laughs> and, um, she, um, she had, you know, it was a book that hadn't been written before, but she, and she found a lot of new things about him, but she failed to talk about them in her introduction. And the reaction of some reviewers and critics was another book about Teddy. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's important uh, to, if you have something new mm -hmm. or a new perspective, I do tons of reviewing, but we have someone in the room who has been a book review editor for eons. How do you deal with that? I mean, I don't mean to put yeah. you on the spot if you don't want to. Um, I think, yeah, like uh, the latest book on, on custody uh, with Daniel Philbrick, mm -hmm. who um, is from my hometown, actually, Pittsburgh, but he lives up here in Massachusetts. So, um, and I was thinking, you know, Another Custer book. <laughs> we need another Custer book. How much more do, we, do readers want to know about George Armstrong Custer? Um, but you start to read it and you realize that it's not about Custer so much as about the whole moment in history in 1875 or whenever that was, June 1876. Pardon me, 1876. So, um, because Philbrick was able to put Custer into a different context, um, that's why it seemed to me to be important to write about this book. Um, because my initial thought was, who cares about George Custer anymore after a little big man and, and the guy with a clown and, and cool. And, but, but it's a completely different portrait. So that's sort of what we do as book review editors is, is that, yeah, there are, there are Teddy Roosevelt books every six months, um, but now, you know, the, the uh, tide has turned and the books are becoming more and more negative about Roosevelt. Bradley, who is here, wrote a very negative book about Roosevelt, The Imperial Cruise. There's a book out now called The War Luggies by Evan Thomas that that concentrates on Eden Roosevelt, Henry Cabot Lodge, and William Randolph Hearst as these war monsters, mm -hmm. uh, and making William James to be sort of a pacifist. It's a very superficially written book, I must say, it skims the surface. But this whole, from after D Douglas Brinkley, th things are changing about Teddy Roosevelt, uh -huh. and uh, not the David McCullough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, times, I think times change, and, and the uh, view of a figure changes, you know, at a different time. Yes. 
I found in writing about a subject who had been covered before that one of the hardest parts was resisting the temptation to put down the stuff that I found that nobody else had found. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you can pick any subject and there's going to be some amount of that material. And the justification for that has to end up on the floor. Because you, you just, just because you've done it. That and justify it on its own strength or throw it away. Mm -hmm. But the, the ego trip that's involved in the research of finding stuff that nobody else has found is probably something we're all familiar with. <laughs> it's not a pretty thing to throw it all away. I really tried to find a, an undiscovered thriller of Louisa May Alcott, because I had a list of about a dozen that hadn't been located. And I had a volunteer librarian who was, you know, went through some back issues of the place, but we, we came up empty. But I did manage to find an interview that had been written, um, been held with Louisa May Alcott's niece in 1976. At that time, she was 96, and she was the last person alive who had ever known Louisa May Alcott. And she was raised by Alcott till she was eight years old. So she knew the family, she knew Franz and Alcott, and she was in a nursing home in Switzerland. And this biographer, Madeline Bedell, uh, went and interviewed her. And in her first volume, um, referred to this interview, a first volume of a projected, uh, I don't think it was projected, but it wound up only getting to age 14 of Louise May Alcott. And um, Madeline Bedell died before she could um, write this second book. So I knew that interview was out there, and I was asking everyone I knew uh, and I did know all the scholars because of making this film. <coughs> and nobody was really too interested. Um, and I even called up Bedell's and phone books sometimes. I just get curious and I say, yeah, I think I'll do this now, you know. Um, and I would be buying, I, I always bought secondhand copies of these books. I was always looking in used stores because there'd be something I did not have. And a lot of her lo things about her were out of print. And I picked up another copy of Bedell's. Uh, biography because the one I had was so marked up. And I picked it up and out of it floats this carbon copy of a letter um, to the travel editor of the New York Times from Madeline Bedell proposing that she do a, a travel article about um, uh, the 30 places that the Alcotts lived before they settled down in Orchard House where everyone thinks they, oh. you know, rested comfortably their whole lives. Um, and at the bottom, there was an address and a phone number in Brooklyn. And this is like 25 years later. And I called the number, and there was Madeline Bedell's widower. Oh, my God. <laughs> and the story goes on, actually, because the, he had loaned the papers to um, someone who was intending to write a book about Amy Alcott, but never did. And she was a real Miss Havisham. And there were lawyers. We, were, we did some blustery talk you know, of lawyers. And finally, I had the papers, and there were interesting things about what happened to Louisa May Alcott's estate, and it shed a lot of light on um, the marriage of Louise May Alcott's sister, um, May Alcott. She was 37, and her husband was 21, and it a cougar. looks like he married her for her sister's money, perhaps, just judging from what happened afterwards, his behavior after Louisa died. And uh, Ma Madeline Medell went to the cemetery where May Alcott was buried, and she went in the records, and it says that um, May Alcott died at 32. Well, her, her next birthday, she would have been 40. <laughs> so she lied to her husband that, you know, she concealed her age. She wasn't, she was 37, he was 21, but. I just changed my mind. My next book is going to be about her. Between, <laughs> between that and the hitchhiker story, I think we're on the road. <laughs> Switch. Switch. That is the quest part. It's really kind of fun, you know. Um, and, and luckily that, that was um, worthwhile, although it's in the epilogue. It doesn't really come up till the very end because Lulu you know, doesn't appear in her life till the last eight years of her life. But I did mention it in the uh, forward. And I told a little bit about that story. By the way, when I said her, I meant Harriet, not Louisa. Yeah. <laughs> you could switch uh, genres to autobiography. Yeah. <laughs> well, we had talked about in the last time about uh, when is it appropriate for a biographer to put themselves in the story, in the story of the hunt or mm -hmm. however, and successful or not successful. And 
I don't know if you have any comments about that. We kind of came up with some treatments that we didn't think worked out and others that seemed useful. I see a lot of negative no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there was this book by Judith Freeman of, uh, tracing the uh, various apartments that Chandler, Raymond Chandler mm -hmm. and his wife lived in. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. In Los Angeles, that they moved something like 33 times in 30 <laughs> years. And the way that she weaved herself into that book, I, I thought really made it work. Mm -hmm. Plus, we learned also that Sissy Chandler was way older than she was told her husband. She was maybe 25, 30 years old. Yeah. And, and it was quite an old woman <laughs> when she died. Uh, and then Chandler even faked the death for her. Wow. To make her younger. Mm -hmm. Oh, is that something? Yeah, but, but, but she you found a lot of these much. places still existed. Mm -hmm. Los yeah. Angeles, and I thought yeah. it was a terrific book, but she was It's a different it. kind of a book, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yes, Anne? There's a uh, meta, it's either a meta novel or a meta biography or a meta autobiography by an English writer named Jeff Dyer, mm -hmm. who's in the book, yep. you know what, it's, it's incredibly good. Uh, it, he is the first-person narrative, he's trying to decide whether to write a novel or whether to write a biography of D.H. Lawrence, mm -hmm. who's, who's journey, mm -hmm. you know, who's, who's traveled, he follows in the book. So it's, it's, it's everything all at once, it's a sort of meditation on how you write a novel, how you write a biography, but it's great. Yeah, I can't think of the name right now. But you know, yes, that's it. There's, you know, there's another one by um, I want to say, someone will correct me, Richard Holmes about in the footsteps of the, he's British. And, yeah, but but there've been a number. there been. Yeah. Oh, well, the the Corvo. Yeah, I mean that's that's a book. Ooh. The the the, cor the cor is it was it the quest for Corvo by Simons S Y M O N D S I think it was A J Simons I mean that's the strangest book ever written about the craft of biography I mean I don't even know I don't have the vocabulary to describe it <laughs> yes um, th there have been you know a small number of books as most of you know that were designed to be about the biographer's quest. And then there have been the other books, some of which we talked about in this morning's session, where the biographer ends up in the book out of desperation, <laughs> as in Edmund Morris and Reagan, you know, yes, Dutch, we'll talk about that. Or, or some others. And so there, there's, a, there's a whole lot to look at in the genre. And if this organization exists long enough, maybe we can put together the most incredible bibliography ever about the craft of biography. That would be wonderful. Mm. Right. I, I, I thank you all for coming today. I think. We've really talked about that the subject of bi the biography is not necessarily the person, and the biographer's relations to the subject is uh, various, shall we say. And uh, I'm thank you for coming. I really enjoyed the discussion myself. Thank you. Thank you.